Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are live once again, and this is the second plenary for this day. And uh, overall, this is the uh, the fourth plenary of our international conference on centers and margins. Uh, today, we have a very dear friend of mine, uh, Professor Kevin Potter, and we met in Delhi uh, during an international conference on Delhi and Guatari. And from there, then on, we have been in touch. And uh, he's a wonderful human being, and we have uh, talked and exchanged our ideas. And uh, you know, I'm so happy to see him on screen again. I was just, uh, you know, telling this to my friends uh, in my college that I'm so happy to see him because I really, really adore and love him. So um, just. Just to uh, put this in context, uh, he is going to talk about uh, the politics of migration and, and, and its various paraphernalia. I just want to start off with a quote of Amitabh Ghosh, where he, in the in this in that wonderful book that he writes called *The Great Derangement*, uh, Amitabh Ghosh writes, "Lot of people coming up, coming across were from Libya, Tunisia, and Egypt. These are countries where I have spent time." I found myself quite hypnotized by the unfolding of this crisis. I started looking at the pictures that were on the front pages of the newspapers. There, there were many South Asian faces in the boats, people from this part of the world. Uh, people who have read his novels like the, uh, the Gun Island would know that how the symbol of the boats and migration and all those issues come in. And uh, Amitabh Ghosh would note that the, the very crisis of migration has entered our backyard. And uh, we cannot uh, at all uh, you know, stay aloof from that because we are all migrants. And of course, the pandemic has taught us that uh, you know, the, the amount of crisis that we can be gripped by. So therefore, I would now request my very dear friend, uh, Professor Sharon Nushen, to kindly introduce Professor Potter and uh, proceed with the session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Nilanjan. A warm welcome back for the second plenary session of the day. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Kevin Porter to all the delegates and the distinguished guests. Uh, Kevin Porter uh, is a university assistant, junior lecturer, and a doctoral student in the Department of English and American Studies at the University of Vienna. He is also a fellow with the Vienna Doctoral Academy for Theory and Methodology in the Humanities and an associated member of the Mobile Culture and Societies Research Platform. Kevin's research interests lie at the intersection of migrant literature, cultural theory, and poetics. In 2020, he was awarded the Dissertation Award for Research on Migration from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He has scholarly articles published or forthcoming in Aerial Poetics Today, Delusian Quatri Studies, New Formations, and In Contrite. And his public writing has appeared in Roar Magazine, Monthly Review, The Millions, and Dissident Voice. He holds a research master's in comparative literary studies from Utrecht University and a bachelor's degree in English from the University of South Florida. I welcome Kevin once again to the session and we all look forward to what promises to be an engaging session of yours. The stage is yours, sir. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone, uh, the organizers of this tremendous seminar uh, for making this possible and putting all of this together. Uh, I'd also like to extend and repeat the, the special shout out to my dear friend and my dear comrade, uh, Neil and John, who extended the generous inv invitation to me. Uh, I had the pleasure, as you said, of meeting you uh, last year. We shared an excellent pan panel, I think, and it was a really rich and exciting time. It seems like a time from a different era when we were able to all travel and meet in one place and, and have a seminar in one place. And I only hope um, it, deep down that we will all meet each other again sometime soon. And uh, uh, it, it, was a, it was certainly a delightful time and I hope to have more events like this one, but hopefully in person. Um, and I'm delighted to be uh, and honored to be addressing you all today, uh, broadcasting to you live from Vienna. Uh, I plan to speak to you for a little less than an hour uh, and some of my comments may be a little bit uh, dense at times, uh, and I hope that afterward there will be room for discussion so that you can ask me to clarify anything, and I look forward to your reactions. I thought about the topic of today's seminar of Centers and Margins, and I began to ask myself how I might offer an intervention. My research field is within the domain of migrant literatures, broadly speaking, and so an obvious way that a scholar in this field 
uh, would might go about this would be to describe migrancy as a condition of marginality and the nation state or the citizen as occupying the center of political power representation in history. But I don't plan to do that today. As for one thing, that's surely nothing new to this audience and is surely something you've heard before. What my talk is going to do today is in some ways complicate this binary between centers and margins in the spirit of academic provocation. But more crucially, I'm going to offer both a politics and a poetics of motion and movement, a major preoccupation of my current doctoral research. And as a result of this, I will move beyond a state-based political paradigm that has governed much of the critical work around migration. And I will reconsider what we might say are the metaphysical questions of representation and power. So in today's talk, I'm going to cover a wide range of issues. I'm going to take you through what I will call a series of junctions, that is to say, places where a confluence of discourses will come into contact. I will begin by outlining what is called a politics of motion. This builds off of an already existing field of research that I'm modifying toward my own theoretical framework. But crucially, I will emphasize the, inno the innovative uh, nature of this approach and to illuminate the theoretical and political stakes. That is to say, why does all of this matter? I will then talk about poetics. This is, of course, a major concern for those of us in literary studies but something we often forget to define in concrete terms. So we'll spend a few minutes on this as well. I will also talk about the relationship between poetics and politics, suggesting that the capacity to make or construct systems of meaning through literature makes legible the intensities of migrancy and the possibilities for social transformation. This, to put it crudely, suggests that politics and poetics are mutually reinforcing. Okay. In my third junction, I will discuss the different types of poetics as I conceive of them in my thesis. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I won't be able to go into too much detail here as it would require plot summaries, close readings, and textual analyses. But I will hopefully give you a taste for how my thesis research is working itself out. I will then conclude to invite you to recognize how this might challenge the standard discourse on migration and migrancy. So let me begin with junction one, the politics of motion. This is a concept you may or may not have heard before, but I'm going to outline what I mean. This paradigm, as I will be using it, comes from the philosopher Thomas Nail. His two books, The Figure of the Migrant and Theory of the Border, attempt to describe what he calls a counter history of the migrant and a counter history of movement. What this means is that we're meant to understand that movement and motion are the dominant political and material forces of society. And as a result, the migrant is the primary constitutive figure of social history. On more concrete terms, we might say that movement creates the conditions for national and political formation, not the other way around. Societies, nations, borders, organs of state power, operate not as static entities with fixed spatial coordinates, but rather as regimes of social motion. And the term that Thomas Nail uses for this is kinopolitics, literally a politics of motion from the word kinesis in Greek, which means to move. The consequence here, as many might anticipate, is that it calls into question loads of political concerns. The liberal notions of sovereignty, statehood, and citizenship, and with them, the attending discourses on citizenship, belonging, securitization, and settlement that govern our international migration discourse. A lot of the legal and juridical restrictions on migration, for example, hinge upon one's ability to settle and to assimilate, while the state expresses its power through its securitizing effort and its capacity to express its sovereignty, its control over territory, and its body politic. If anyone's interested in looking into this th further, I highly recommend James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State. But also one can easily see this in the language of far-right neo-fascist political campaigns, 
describing their need to secure the homeland, panicking that immigrants present a, an existential threat to sovereignty and national identity. It's all connected through what theorists often call a sedentarist metaphysics, that is to say, a metaphysics of stasis and settlement. So to describe history and state formation, state formation instead as a process of movement suggests that we no longer relegate migration to a secondary political status. And the migrant as a figure is no longer consigned to the margins. Again, I, off I offer this to you to ponder with respect to the seminar theme. In fact, if we look carefully throughout history, we recognize that patterns of expanding or consolidating political power are conditioned through movement and motion. History operates through a logic of expansion by expulsion. Here I'm going to quote Thomas Nail directly. Quote, expansion by expulsion is the social logic by which members of society are dispossessed of their status so that social power can be expanded elsewhere. Now you might already realize that, car that this carries on a concept, a longer standing tradition that we inherit from Marx and has been reevaluated several times throughout the past century and a half. Neil is suggesting here that instead of seeing, quote, primitive accumulation, to use Marx's term, as the first stage of capitalist development, depriving people of land in order to seize property and thus turning them into an industrial reserve army, Nail rather shows that a much broader history sees this process as constantly ongoing and perpetuates itself through the ability to manage and control human movement. But what are the political consequences of Kino politics? Well, again, if we think about this in connection with Marx, for example, we know that Marxism places a premium on the proletariat, the working class, as a historically constitutive figure of class struggle. They are uniquely positioned to hold capital hostage, but also their relation to production and exploitation leaves them deprived of the means of production, enabling the endless extraction of surplus value from their labor. Well, in Kino politics, we also have the proletariat, but we also have other figures who precede the history of capitalism and industrialization, but also who function not just in the supply of wage labor and value, but who enable power to expand in all directions through coveting resources and expelling surplus population, wielding social and juridical control through criminalization and confinement, and weaponizing ideological systems of racism and nationalism for the sake of enslavement and dispossession. Now through this process, we have not one, but four specific figures of the migrant, the nomad, the vagabond, the barbarian, and the proletariat, or the proletarian, excuse me. Again, I won't go into too much detail here, but I recommend Thomas Nail's book, The Figure of the Migrant, to get a better sense for this theory and political philosophy. But the bigger concern here is to recognize that throughout history, different regimes of social motion have been generated by and constructed according to patterns of movement, and, um, excuse me, uh, patterns of movement that migrants have created. Yet there's something else to recognize here, and it confronts one of the fundamental questions we have with respect to identity, difference, centers, and margins. Since, according to this system, the migrant is the primary constitutive figure of social history, it means that we can place the migrant in a rather unique, perhaps positive, political position. We can, in a sense, see the migrant as an affirmative and positive figure, rather than, again, a marginal and secondary political figure. Because what we actually realize is that migration as a historical process precedes and exceeds the formation of borders. Borders only exist to control and manage motion, but motion itself creates the necessary political and material conditions to require borders in the first place. This means then that the bordering process is an effort to contain and confine migration into an identity, to thus re-territorialize it within a regime of, nas of nation states and citizenship. 
Now, of course, this ties into other theoretical questions, broadly inheriting the ideas of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. Don't worry, I will get to that a little bit later. I will say one final thing here in this junction, with the power and force that the migrant actually has in Aquino politics. This is what Thomas Nail calls a pedetic social force. Quote, pedetic motion is the force of the foot to walk, to run, to leap, or to dance. As a social form of motion, it is defined by its autonomy and self-motion. It is different from the social forces of sort of uh, political kino power, the, that is to say the powers of domination in society, because it has neither a center nor a surplus. Instead, its movement is irregular. It is unpredictable. It is turbulent. It does not expand by social expulsion, but by inclusive social transformation. Another way of putting this would be to say that we ought to acknowledge not only the conditions for political formation, but the transformative capacity for political change. The migrant moves against or redirects social motion in order to destabilize power and to push against the regimes that wish to expel them and exclude them. In this way, the migrant demonstrates a positive and affirmative capacity empowered to create new social territories and new regimes of motion with their own active and transformative political power. Pedetic force is the force of autonomy that migrants enact as a way of forging their own motion, applying collective pressure against the fortified territories of political power, creating a strong collective flux or wave. The migrant thus transforms and destabilizes the presumed primacy of social stasis, creating motion and lines of flight of their own. By enacting their pedetic force and counter movement against the forces of political expansion, each figure of the migrant creates new possibilities for social formation and thus rejects the coercive push of dispossession. The migrant, therefore, is a revolutionary figure of social history, the figure through which political change occurs. Now, this is what a kino politics looks like, going against the standard model and paradigm for political history, often modeled through a static system of state-based power and liberal discourses of citizenship. Kino politics instead treats movement as the dominant political force, and this is the theory where the migrant is an affirmative and positive figure. I'm now going to move on to junction number two, which pulls this theory of kino politics into the domain of literary studies. Because what I think this political theory of movement is missing is a dimension that relates to language, affect, and knowledge. And what I'll attempt to show as best I can is that invoking poetics takes the politics of motion I just outlined and brings it to the next step. That is to say, it makes migrancy and pedetic social force visible and knowable. So in my years of developing this project over the last three or so years, I've noticed that at least in the Anglophone world, at least in the Anglo-American and European contexts in which I study, there's a widespread amnesia about what we mean when we say poetics, partially because it's evolved over the centuries, especially in the academic study of theory. I won't go into detail about this, but there are a few important features to bear in mind. Right off the bat, before I give my definition of poetics, I have to insist that we keep in mind how this term ought to be used. Poetics, as I will conceive of it, is both a methodology and an object of study. So it tells us on the one hand, the ontological status of a particular text, what it is composed of, how it works, what is literary about it, and what are the de devices that characterize it as a cultural form of media, if you like, or as an aesthetic form. But then on the other hand, it tells us how to approach a text, what we're looking for, and how to write about a literary text. How does our language stage or reflect this reoriented critical perspective? So you use a particular type of framing, a particular lexical constellation, certain words, certain signposts that help draw out the relation to your critique. One knows this quite well if you've read the work of Jacques Derrida, whose deconstruction methodology operates by staging and performing rather than describing 
the very instability of signification. Now with this in mind, let me state what I believe the poetics as an object of study is meant to be. And in my mind, this operates on two interrelated levels. So when I teach this, but also when I write about this in my dissertation, this is how I define poetics. One, it is the formal and linguistic qualities within a text that produce a certain effect. Basic, right? The form. And number two is, it's the manner in which broad systems of meaning, that is to say, systems that determine what is thinkable and unthinkable, visible and invisible, how they are connected and constructed in our social life. So this definition may not be perfect, but it has worked for me in a number of ways. If you notice, it can, a lot, there's a lot that can fit in this definition. The first part of this definition, we can include things like form, style, narrative structure, linguistic experimentation, focalization, and features of literary defamiliarization. Those are the things we look for in poetics in the narrower sense. If you're familiar with the long tradition of narratology, formalism, poetics, you see where these concepts come from. But also in the bigger picture, if we remember that poetics comes from the Greek word poiesis, we, might, we note that it has to do with making. And making, as we all know, is not the unique currency of the poet. It rather extends beyond the confines of the page to be about all constructed systems of meaning. Now, I use the word constructed here very deliberately to suggest that we should commit ourselves to the act of creation of meaning by a writer or an artist, but also by institutions, by institutions of power, which contain within them a certain ideological purpose. So the key point of poetics, as I see, is not to limit ourselves merely to poetry or even to literature for that matter, but we might still confine our scope simply to those activities which are deliberately constructed. And then beyond that, we can understand it as anything that generates a certain effect or a regime of meaning that can be style, but it, also, it can also be more than this. In either case, the object of study we are looking for is something that makes an existence, that is to say, a social intensity or a subjectivity visible, knowable, and thinkable. As such, defining poetics in this way enables me to reflect upon the relationship that literature has as a constitutive part of social and cultural and political knowledge, changing the field changing the regime of what we can recognize and see and comprehend in the world around us. Now to, add, to explain this even further, I'm going to describe how a movement-oriented politics, that is to say kino politics, becomes a movement-oriented poetics. In other words, how does kino politics become kino poetics? And that is the term I use in my dissertation to describe this theoretical framework for analyzing migrant literature. One way to do this is to insist that there is a continuity between art, knowledge, and movement. And from here, I build upon the work of Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, taking cues from what we know to be the affective turn in critical theory. Now, I won't go into a lot of dense detail here. If someone would like to ask me about it in the q and I'm happy to, to address the finer, more complicated points. Um, but for the sake of this lecture, I'll simplify this outline about affect theory and art. And the thinking goes like this. When we read something, a novel, a poem, or a play, we inhabit the lives of characters. We are also moved in an emotional and affective way. The language strikes us, shaking our foundations of knowledge and giving us a new relational sense of the world. Or we may vividly witness violence or struggle in ways that leave us sympathetic toward, but this, at the same time intimately connected to the character's pain. We may even perhaps be forced to confront a life, thoughts, or words we would otherwise never know. Such aspects have the capacity to impart upon us affects, visceral bodily reactions that we may not notice, but whose compounding expansion and intensity moves us enabling us to relate to society in different ways. Affect is about what Brian Masumi, as many know, is the translator, one of the translators of A Thousand Plateaus, calls a margin of maneuverability, or, quote, where we might be able to go and what we might be able to do in a present situation. 
According to thinkers in this tradition, a body is an entity subject to material and political circumstances, all of which change the subject's capacity to move freely or to feel joy, that is to say, to be affected. Affect here relates to emotion just as much as it relates to knowledge. It produces shocks, as Masumi calls them, or states of transition, uh, what Deleuze calls intensities, that allow us to understand and feel the immediate present better, to experiment with creative ways of moving beyond it. We are intensively shaken out of one state of mind and forced into another. The resulting belief then is that, quote, with intensified affect, comes a stronger sense of embeddedness in the larger field of life, a, height, a heightened sense of belonging with other people and to other places. So here, a body's free ability to move produces an epistemology that situates the body in knowing where it can move and how easily, which for affect theorists constitutes the basis of our ethical and political subjectivity. That is to say, according to Deleuze, the power is based on relative speeds and slownesses generated through a maximization or minimization of affects. The capacity for these modes of feeling and seeing are based on affects intensity, the ability to affect or be affected as Deleuze calls it or puts it. As stated above, art and literature uphold this capacity for creating affects. We can be shaken or moved by what we read while simultaneously reshaping our ability to think and understand the world. Again, if you've read Deleuze and Guattari's book, What is Philosophy? You note that they see art as having the ability to create a quote, composite sensation made up of percepts and affects, deterritorializes the system of opinion that brought together dominant perceptions and affects within a natural historical and social milieu. This then gives us an idea of how kinopoetics can make, in the sense of poiesis, movement. It engenders an intensive movement at the level of the body and perception. By doing so, the boundaries of what can be apprehended in the social world is changed. With migrant literature, the complexities and challenges that constitute the inner lives of the migrant, along with the material conditions they are forced to confront, imbue in us new worlds and intensities, thereby making migrant existence visible and legible. So this is where I'm going to leave junction number two. We've discussed so far the politics of movement or kinopolitics. I then outlined how politics can become poetics as we recognize the role that literature and aesthetics play in shaping our knowledge of the world and doing so through an intensive movement of affect. In junction number three, I'd like to uh, discuss briefly how the object of study, that is to say migrant literature, might engender and present a kinopoetics. And this is where I'll offer for you a typology of kinopoetics. Now, as a genre, migrant literature has considerable diversity in terms of form, language, and transnational context. Because of this, kinopoetics cannot be a general theory of migrant literature, but simply an interpretive framework through which it can productively be analyzed, that is to say, brought into a politics of motion. So from here, I'd like to suggest that one can locate three different types of kinopoetics coinciding with specific subgenres of migrant literature. This typology is no means comprehensive, and one can imagine this kinopoetics being expanded to analyze an even wider range of subgenres. Moreover, my focus is on migrant literature as opposed to other adjacent genres. So for example, I don't look at diasporic literatures, transnational literatures, or strictly post-colonial literatures. The reason for this is to maintain the centrality of the migrant within the narrative. To be more precise, I limit my scope to migrant texts uh, of migrant texts to those which focalize the migrant, either from a first person or third person limited point of view, thereby reflecting the internal affective and relational experiences of migrancy. The first type of kinopoetics is what I shall call a destructive kinopoetics. This relates to the genre of magic realism, whereby magic realist authors, uh, uh, excuse me, destroy the parameters of time and space and displace the centrality of a unified social milieu to make way for a, a divergent and decentered world. The resulting idea is to show a world that transcends the bounded limitations of the nation state 
It places a primacy or privilege on the convergence of two worlds into world into one, what Salman Rushdie calls a stereoscopic vision. Here, we're drawn into the migrant's experience of a world that is otherwise contradictory or paradoxical, showing us how the migrant often has to negotiate between two versions of re reality, or precisely, or more precisely, between a plurality of, of epistemic constellations. The second type of kinopoetics will be a wandering kinopoetics. This uh, considers the historical figure of the vagabond and their position in certain post-colonial and migrant literatures. Crucially, the emphasis here is on the urban and city space, thereby offering a unique and conflicting spatial experience. On the one hand, the migrant figure attempts to blend into a social milieu by not sticking out as an outsider, yet their outsider status leaves them criminalized and alienated to the very society into which they are trying to assimilate. This section will explore the movement of the vagabond who, as Zygmunt Bauman famously puts it, was the bane of early modernity, the bugbear that spurred the rulers and philosophers into an ordering and legislating frenzy. The Vagabond offers a distinct configuration of criminalized migrancy as the wandering subject having to negotiate various sites of power, while, all while embodying a wayward or erratic subjectivity. Such a subject to this position will allow me to comment on the affective and internal experiences that come with criminalized and ostracized subjects in a capitalist world. Yet I will affirm these erratic and wayward intensities as transformational and positive. That is to say, it will treat the recalcitrant movement of the migrant as something which produces and transforms the social milieu on their own terms, especially one in which the economic realities of precarity, gentrification, and multiculturalism, but also racism and violence are made so visible. The third and final type of kinopoetics will be called a stuttering kinopoetics. This section adopts Deleuze's insistence that creative stuttering is what makes language grow from the middle, like grass. It is what put, puts language in perpetual disequilibrium. The implications here are significant in terms of migration and cross-cultural encounters within language. Authors within the migrant tradition will often employ playful or non-standard uses of English to demonstrate the unique relationship migrants have toward language. This in turn upsets and frustrates the typical reading experience, having to also deal with changing rhythmic, grammatical, and syntactical structures. Putting language into disequilibrium in turn creates vibrations and shifts in linguistic orderings thereby breaking open the typical ordering of English grammatical structure and moving our perception into new uh, epistemic regime. As many of you know, this reflects a reality that many of us immigrants, I include myself in this as an immigrant to Austria, have to navigate whereby we're compelled to achieve a certain competence in a foreign language, which in turn determines our perceived level of assimilation to and enculturation within society, but also our access to the job market. But here I'd like to suggest that the relationship to language can also be a creative one, where the migrant figure invents a new language on their own terms, offering a revolutionary capacity to bend language against the confines of standardization and the regimes of competency. Now I'd like to add here that the reason I insist on this typology has to do with the politics of motion and migration. What we understand from keto politics is, not, is that not every migrant is the same, nor do their movements and subjectivity operate with the same intensity. They follow different speeds, different trajectories, depending on the material, juridical, and political conditions that compel motion. So when looking at migrant literature, a genre also with considerable diversity, it's important that I locate different configurations of migrancy that correspond to each genre. I also, I already mentioned, for example, the vagabond within the wandering city space in their position within a regime of criminality. There is also the nomad, a figure of disidentification and what we might say deterritorialization, again, to use the deluso guattarian concept, is suitable for the genre of magic realism. It destroys the parameters of time and space. And there is the barbarian, the racialized figure of difference whose foreignness is largely linguistic. 
and whose stuttering corresponds to experimentations with sound and language. With this typology, the goal is to focus on the subjective, material, relational, and affective experiences of migrancy. Crucially, I will be viewing migrant literature through a lens that focalizes movement, disruption, affect, and hybridity, shedding light on the converging material and affective forces that influence and condition migrancy. I view the migrant figure as the socially constitutive figure of social history. I thereby, I thereby relate them to the national and political assemblies based on, based on their potential to complicate and displace borders. The object of study then is the movements, affective and epistemic, that these texts make in the sense of poiesis and enact as they experiment with space, time, narrative structure, and language. And here I will conclude my talk for today. The stakes of recognizing the constitutive and material forces that condition human movement today could not be higher. I recently read a startling report from the UN the other day stating that despite COVID lockdown restrictions, the number of forcibly displaced persons is at an all time high. Quote, the number of people fleeing wars, violence, persecution, and human rights violation rose last year to 8.2 million people, a further 4% increase on top of the already record high of 79.5 million people recorded at the end of 2019. To me, such dire circumstances require that we have clarity about the material and political conditions of movement and motion within our global society. What I'd like to suggest to you is that we're unlikely to truly apprehend the complexity of this situation until we're able to make movement knowable, thinkable, visible, and legible to us at an effective and intensive level. This is what I think migrant literature can do. This is what we, I believe we as scholars can also do. We have the ability to frame our critical discussions of migration to better reflect the constitutive and primary role of movement throughout global history. In turn, I implore us all to reevaluate migration and movement, not from a marginal, subaltern, peripheral, or minor position, but rather as an affirmative flow that produces and creates history. Therefore, there are no centers and there are no margins. There are only flows, circulations, and junctions going at different speeds and taking different paths. They are generated through the migrants' pedetic force, their walking, their running, dancing, wandering, and stuttering force that they enact in transforming history. I thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your responses and your questions. Fantastic. I mean, that was one session, Kevin. It was so enlightening, so enlightening for all of us. We were in rapt attention. Everything about the book presentation, everything about it was perfect. Even the timing, even the timing. I guess Nilanjan, you didn't even have to remind you of the fact that you were running short. It, it was so well knit, so wonderfully well put. Um, I'd of course uh, take up some um, questions that um, our participants have posted uh, in YouTube. And uh, after that, of course, I take this opportunity of asking two questions that I have from your paper. But before that, the first is, of course, uh, from uh, Bipro. It's more of an observation uh, where he says that kind of politics is a, an area of growing significance. We definitely agree on that. And it, of course, opens up uh, some serious opportunities for research, isn't it, Kevin? Yeah, that's correct. In fact, I mean, there's a quite robust field, um, what is often called the new mobilities paradigm. I kind of work adjacent to this field. It's, a, it's slightly different from a philosophy of movement. And that is to say that a new mobilities paradigm operates by also considering things like non-human movement, but also the movement of media and, and, and kind of transporting regimes. Um, I, I have a lot of sympathy for this field. I've, I've published in this field in other ways. Um, and I think that uh, the richness um, that has come out of people like, um, people like uh, Mimi Scheller, people like Timothy Cresswell, um, uh, and others um, uh, have, have just done tremendous work. Uh, so I highly recommend, if anyone's interested, you know, the, the, the foundational text in this field, one of the foundational texts in this field is On the Move by Tim Cresswell. Uh, I highly recommend this book. 
um, but also the entire journal Mobilities. I mean, there they have been around for I think a little, uh, I think maybe about 10 years now, maybe even more. Um, and that journal uh, is, is constantly uh, calling upon new fields and they, and they have entire, entire journals devoted strictly to literature, just strictly to the humanities. I, I, I really, I think this field is an extremely rich one. So absolutely. Absolutely, right. Right, Kevin, and the second question, this comes from Shayantika Shen, uh, where she says, sir, could you please elaborate on the relationship of kinopolitics and body-based perception of the world? Sure. So um, this, you know, this is this is this is something that, um, as I say, is 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 a sort of dense topic. So you'll forgive me for having to elaborate on on some dense theory, but um, in a sense, the the idea of perception through affect considers the fact that that is also based on movement. Now, you may not agree with this or you may not accept those terms, but these are the terms that um, the kind of, if you like, the new materialist or the Deleuzians or the process metaphysics all derive from Spinoza, right? There's been a kind of resurgence of Spinozist uh, theoretical politics, particularly from the 1970s onward. And they describe the aspects of internal and kind of affective liberation through process and through motion. And so what I would like to suggest is that Kino politics is about extensive movement, you know, people moving from place to pay, place uh, across time and space, right? Movement at the internal and knowledge level is intensive movement. That is to say, it's movement that is kind of discrete. We can't really locate it, but it grows and compounds. And if, you're, if you understand this to say intensities are something which grow and, and, and don't certain uh, exceed time and space, but become stronger, the, the, the more affects are generated. Again, this, this can be a little bit heady for you. So I can also direct you to other texts. Um, Brian Masumi's book, The Politics of Affect is quite good here. Um, uh, John Pertevi's book, Political Affects is also very good. Um, and I might suggest to you uh, also a recent book by, by Ian Buchanan called Assemblage Theory and Method. Um, he has a whole chapter of this uh, in that book. So uh, I, I'm afraid I couldn't go into more detail without having to sort of uh, quote and quote and quote endlessly, but that's the best I can say is to say that instead of extensive movement, which is Kino politics, this is about intensive movement, okay? Excellent, excellent. So many of our participants are young researchers who, and some of them are in their last years of their masters. So they are thinking about getting into research. This session is going to be seriously helpful for them for sure. Uh, I guess there is no other question from uh, the participants, but uh, I have two questions, Kevin. Right. Uh, I was so excited while I was listening to you. I don't know whether I can really put it in a well-formed manner. But the first thing is that when you said the po when you actually write at the poetics bit of your uh, paper or your presentation, uh, I was wondering uh, the the poetics of migration, if I may say so, uh, is it a sort of a reactive gesture? Because uh, I was actually we have this book of Sarah Ahmed, the cultural politics of emotion, right right here with me. Uh, there, Ahmed actually, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, notes down some extremely important words uh, uttered by very important, uh, I mean, political office bearers of UK. Um, I mean, no price for guessing, they're from the Conservative Party, of course. Um, uh, William Hague in 2000, uh, between April and June 20, uh, 2000, uh, among the other speeches, uh, he would always make it a point that uh, they are, I mean, the migrants are stuck. They're attached to the asylum seeking habit. And in 2003, the British Home Secretary, David Blunkett, would be using words such as swamped, overwhelmed, uh, to kind of, uh, I mean, describe the issue of migration and asylum seeking in England. Uh, and suddenly when I have, I mean, put this in perspective and listen to, say, the poetry of Rafif Ziada, right? Um, a poem like Hadil or We Teach Life, Sir. Uh, I mean, somehow I feel that this comes as a reaction proper, like this ultra-conservative approach towards uh, towards this uh, migration, which 
had been historically the most important gift to mankind that you just mentioned, the resistance to that, uh, this kind of generates this poetics of migration. So is the poetics of migration uh, more of a reactive gesture or does it have a strength of its own, Kevin? I would say that I think you have it exactly right because, um, in fact, in my in my thesis, that's exactly how I position this. So one example, I'll use another example um, because it's it's more immediate to me. Um, I I once I, I had the, the the mispleasure of a few years ago discovering a, a political pamphlet, which was created by UKIP. Everyone knows UKIP. They were the sort of British party that spearheaded the Brexit campaign, and they have this extraordinary it's this extraordinary document. Um, it's an extraordinary document because of what it reveals about this kind of nationalist rage, this nationalist resentment, you know, uh, the only time that the word immigrant is ever brought up, you know, it's positioned with, you know, it's, it's, it's framed alongside other words like uh, threatening, um, terrorist, uh, uh, unstable, um, criminal immigration. These are all words that are meant to generate to you associations and also meant to get you just outraged. I mean, it's a pamphlet, so you know, you read it while you're walking around the city. In my case, you know, how can you, when that is such a strong political force and it's so, it, and, and, it, and it plays such a, such a mainstream political role, I mean, we know that it has, we know that historically it has, we know that. Um, in India, it has. I mean, the RSS and the BJP, they, they, they more or less lean on very similar ideological constructs as well. Um, this, is, this, is, this is not a new, this is not a new uh, invention. Um, and what I'm positioning as a migrant poetics is in a, in a sense a counter history, but also a counter discourse, um, which Maybe not, I may, I may not say it's sort of, um, maybe not reactive, but I may, may put it more precisely as a kind of, um, as an intervention, you know, again, another intervention, or, or if you like, uh, uh, um, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the, you know, political philosophies I have a lot of sympathy for, you know, coming, coming through a tradition of like anarchists and anarchists who sort of, position themselves as individual liberation and the liberation of desire, which goes against the transcendent models. So I, I really, this is where I come from at this, is, is you know, to, to liberate ourselves from all of these discourses and, and design a new one. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. And we already have uh, two questions, I guess, from the participants right now coming up. Uh, one is uh, Shobita Boral. Um, she asks, sir, any book on kind of politics and queer? So can you suggest any for her? Uh, Kevin, I guess you are on mute, so you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, I have to say that I don't know any. Um, okay. I, 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 this, the, 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 the field of kino politics is relative, uh, kino politics particularly is relatively new. Um, but the, as I say, if you look more, if you widen, you, if you widen, uh, Make your scope a bit wider to the broader new mobilities paradigm. If you look up that term, and 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 maybe you know through a, through a Google search, say new mobilities paradigm and queer studies, you might find a lot going on there. Um, in within specific kino politics, I don't know that you would find it, um, but surely um, you know that would I would invite you to invent that field if if you're looking for a for a research project. I'm sure uh, I'm sure we would be happy to see whatever uh, contribution you have. That's, that's one research goal that you have, Shobita Boral, right now. Uh, I take up Nishorgo Bhattacharya's question over here. And uh, Nishorgo asks, can you elaborate how kind of politics might differ from Butler's idea of performativity? Ah, that's a really good question. Actually, to, to say it actually, um, it actually, there's actually some continuities there. Um, uh, particularly in the section when I describe the stuttering Kino poetic. Because as I say there, it's about language creating a certain effect. And so uh, in being able to actually uh, create something and have a, an actual material impact through language is precisely its performative effect. So actually, there, there is a connection there. I think 
I think, performativity and to describe particular um, linguistic experimentation as having a performative quality. And in fact, um, read, uh, again, I, forgive me, I'm a Deleuzian. If you go to Deleuzian Guattari's um, uh, postulates on linguistics, they are very explicit about this, that stuttering is a performative and pragmatic linguistic process. Um, and, so, and so Judith Butler saying that, you know, gender subject formation is through the performativity of language or hate speech has a kind of performative effect, uh, effect, not affect, but also affect. <laughs> uh, and both of these uh, are, are interconnected in a number of ways. So it's certainly, there is certainly a relationship there. Um, it's not an immediate one, but it, you have to, again, be willing to accept some of the, uh, the, the, the affective um, um, concepts, which not a, lot of, not a lot of people do, but, but I think there is a relationship there. Right. Uh, and our principal, madam, uh, Dr. Upita Montal, has a question for you. Uh, is there any gender-based view on kind of politics? Um, that is a very good question. Again, um, my particular focus um, in my research certainly has connections to, it's certainly not incidental to, or certainly not irrelevant to the study of Kino politics, especially if you talk about things like um, domestic worker relations um, and, and things like um, uh, a certain, um, if, you, if you combine with, with uh, Sylvia Federici's fabulous book, um, Caliban and the Witch. Uh, if you've ever read that book, I think it's a fabulous book. Um, talks about the history of gender as, a, as another kind of way of naturalizing processes of dispossession. So there are, there are sort of references to gender, but a, a more specific emphasis on gender. Uh, again, not that I necessarily know of offhand. In my own research, um, for example, I have an entire chapter on the novel um, The Mistress of Spices, uh, which uh, a book which which uh, considers a, a lot of gender politics as it interrelates with, with migration. Um, and and so, so it's, again, it's not incidental to the study and it's not irrelevant to the study, but a specific emphasis on gender, um, I think you may have to turn elsewhere. And uh, I, of course, would once again take this opportunity to ask my second question over here, Kevin. Uh, you have mentioned about the condition that my country is currently going through. Uh, actually, uh, here in the situation is a tad, uh, I must say, queer in the sense uh, that here, this fear of migration, this anxiety of migration is hanging um, like a sword over the head of a certain community. Uh, through a certain legislation, they uh, are threatened every single day uh, to be, I mean, evicted from their homeland, right? Uh, so the migration is not happening, but it is as if forever coming for them. And they're living under this... I mean, terrible shadow of being uh, evicted from their, their not only their home, but their identity and everything um, might very well get jeopardized in the coming days. And this is one serious threat that they're dealing with. And that, to, much to the relief of a humanities practitioner like me and you, uh, that has actually given birth to a lot of poetry. Right. And Amir Aziz, there is one uh, poet uh, who has actually composed some I mean, seriously beautiful lines, and one of them has got much popularity, and it was even uh, translated by Roger Waters of Pink Floyd. Uh, it actually reads, right, it actually reads, Sab Yadra Kha Jayega, which means everything will be remembered. Uh, I would just like to, I mean, take this opportunity to ask you, like, uh, what might be uh, kind of politics's role over here, where that kindness is, that forced migration is not happening? But is the threat of it is forever looming large right there at the boundary? Uh, how kind of politics would view this, this precarious subject position of, let me be very frank about it, the Muslims in India currently? Yeah, what a brilliant question. Thank you for asking that. I, I, I would have to think about it further, and I might come up with a more sophisticated answer later on once I have some time. But I, I love the question because um, the idea you know, as you describe it, is not that it's happening presently, but is, is a threat of happening. It's always on the horizon as happening. And what we have to remember about what we can mean by something being, what I think, what I think we can think about in terms of poetry's force here 
is that it helps us, again, apprehend something before it becomes uh, recognized. Um, if you've read, uh, uh, you know, speaking of Judith Butler, someone brought up Judith Butler earlier. She has a book called Frames of War. And what she says is the difference between apprehending something and recognizing it. Apprehending it is before it has, become, it has reached its coherent and recognized form. And I think what put poetry in my reading has, is to catch it before, it before it's too late, to see it before it becomes too obvious, before the impact of it is so uh, difficult. And one thing I wish I had said in my presentation and what I think is really important to what you just said is that when we can apprehend something before it's too late, before it becomes a reality that has sunk in, we also have this ability to generate our own emotional proximity and solidarity with our Muslim brothers and sisters and our Muslim comrades who are dealing with this struggle at all times. And I am of the opinion, and I, and I, and I think it, many of you share the opinion, that that's one thing that sort of language and aesthetics and arts has the capacity to do is to bring us into relation with each other. And, and before it becomes something that the official political regime decides on their own terms, we get to decide on our terms where that solidarity comes from. And the poets get to decide on, the ter on their terms how they will be remembered, right? How they will be seen, how they will be apprehended. And I think that's something that I have to insist is, you know, one of my biggest political values is generating solidarity with, with, our, with our brothers and sisters in struggle. Sure, it is, it is the job that we have at our hand for sure. And this is exactly where a seminar like this uh, and humanities uh, in general has, uh, I mean, the greatest job at hand currently, if I may say so, more than ever, now more than ever. Right, I guess there are no more questions. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the compliment. And um, uh, if there is uh, no other question, then I guess, Kevin, it's time I thank you once again for that brilliant session. Yeah, uh, uh, Shonanda, I'll just inter sure. interject a bit. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, Kevin, with your permission, just with your permission, if you just permit me, uh, we have uh, Dr. Dash over here with us, uh, who is again a very prolific uh, professor. You know, uh, Shonanda, uh, I was just wondering, because Kevin was talking about this whole idea of the migrant subject, right? And uh, the flow and, and and how the migrant subject is flowing with, with that threat and, and, and this whole idea of exclusion, as it were. So uh, I was just wondering, Sean, with the, if you, you know, because uh, seminars like this should bridge the gap. So we have bridged Austria with India, Africa with India. In the next session, we are going to bridge America with India. So uh, if you can just maybe uh, in, in, in a couple of sentences or whatever, you know, if, if you can just talk uh, about a couple of books in Bangla, in, in, in Bengali literature, which talks about such uh, migration literatures, because I think it is very important for us to exchange these ideas in, in such platforms. With your permission, Kevin. Uh, um, absolutely. It is uh, is uh, Pakhi Khoje. I would like to uh, refer here, and there are lots more. Um, we can talk about uh, Nilkontho Pakhi Khoje. There are a lot of immigration processes going on um, through the um, a big uh, sphere of time, and the immigrants itself they 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 just uh, uh, they themselves consider that uh, they are the part of the journey uh, which they never feel actually right. that is uh, there are a lot more books and a uh, lot to say uh, you can say on this right right so thank you shangu mitudi for that uh, so sharunada i will uh, sort of now ask you to uh, conclude but before you conclude i thank again uh, you know kevin kevin you know i'm getting uh, i don't know hundreds of whatsapp messages and uh, people are you know thanking you and many of them are uh, wanting your uh, you know contact details uh, because they want to get in touch with you right so, it would be my pleasure it would be my pleasure feel free uh, if you have my email please send it on and again i just want to thank you all so much for this tremendous honor wow. neil and john again it's such a pleasure and honor to see you uh it's it's been it's been such a wonderful year getting to know you and thank you all so much for this uh, opportunity i wish you all solidarity and uh love for the rest of the weekend
Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Professor Sen, if you can just uh, formally conclude the session. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, once again, um, you have actually made this session so lively that uh, we could have listened to you for hours together. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and I'm sure that you have a lot to tell us. Uh, so, uh, I would not officially, but I'd kind of make it uh, an invitation to you to have a session with our college, my college, that is, someday. I'll definitely get in touch with you. Uh, would love to listen to you and the you know, politics thing is something that we need to discuss at length because this is where the horizon expands. This is where we show and exercise solidarity. So in solidarity, Kevin, more yes, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank you parts. very much. Thank you. Thank you.